I am not suggesting or recommending you follow anything I say in this video, as pregnant women and children are very sensitive topics. I will simply be presenting information on the importance of vitamin and mineral intake during pregnancy and other key stages of development. This is something that sits very close to my heart personally. I was born a triplet. I have a brother and a sister. Unfortunately, my sister is mentally disabled and I contribute that to a lack of nutrition in the womb, preconception, all of these things. A lot of the things that are blamed on genetics, I am not led to believe that. There is a lot of information out there in regards to conventional wisdom and preconceived notions from things like taking prenatal vitamins, which have some merit to them, but can't solve all nutritional problems. And common foods that pregnant women are told to avoid tend to actually be some of the highest vitamin foods there are. I was reading on a forum the other day about a woman that was craving egg yolks, but she didn't act on the craving because she was afraid of bacteria. This can also be related to vegans who are craving meat and animal products but aren't acting on them. There may be a small bacterial risk with certain animal foods if they are not handled properly, but that risk is not inherent to the animal food itself or the raw food itself. That is from improper food handling and cross-contamination. How many people have gotten sick from E. coli, salmonella, and vegetables over the past few years? We are depriving mothers of the most nutrient-dense foods, raw animal foods. And in the case of vegans, they're just depriving themselves. I think that anyone would agree the most important thing for a growing child is the nutrient content of their mother's breast milk because if that's not what it is, then what would contribute to the health of the growing child if not the only thing they are consuming? In these studies that I am going to present, we see a great variance in the levels of DHA and omega-3 fatty acids as well as fat-soluble vitamins in the breast milk of these mothers. Establishing that this is the most important thing makes it easy to see why an animal food diet is best for all stages of development. Animal foods have the highest amount of vitamins in the most available form. Not only that, indigenous groups fed specific animal foods to their couples trying to conceive, pregnant and nursing women, as well as children during early stages of life, particularly fatty, wild-caught animals. Examples of these foods may have been fatty shellfish like crab or lobster, raw grass-fed butter if they had access to dairy, organ meats, especially things like fish eggs. The reason that these foods were almost worshipped in all of these native and primitive societies is because animal foods were the only source of actual vitamin and mineral nutrition they have. Upon looking further into the nutrient content of plant foods versus animal foods, animal foods not only have vitamins that plant foods are missing, every single vitamin that is in animal foods is in a more available form than the plant version, and in some cases, the plant version is not available at all. The studies that we're going to focus on specifically are on the fat-soluble vitamins and omega-3 fatty acids that are only present in animal foods. Here we have a study showing that nutrition in early childhood may have a long-term association with fundamental cognitive processing speed. Here we see that egg consumers had higher intake of protein, fat, vitamin K, vitamin E, selenium, beta carotene, cholesterol, fatty acids, especially DHA, indicating that eggs played a huge role in contributing to the nutrient content of their diets. Milk and protein intake during gestational period showed enhancement of fetal growth. This study shows that fat intake is associated with infant temperament, which is basically how the baby acts and sleeps. A low saturated fat intake was negatively associated with this. Lowering cholesterol in the diet reduces blood flow through the placenta. We can assume this has a drastic impact on nutrient transport. Giving pregnant women advice that they need to lower their cholesterol intake when pregnancy might actually be one of the most dangerous things that someone can do. And if cholesterol is required and has these effects on human metabolism, how can we argue that cholesterol in any way, shape, or form is bad? From this study here, we can conclude that carotenes are not an adequate source of vitamin A when bioavailability is considered. In this case, some people cannot convert carotene to vitamin A, and even if they can, 
The conversion rates see great diminishing returns when trying to obtain adequate nutrition from plant food forms of carotenes. Here we see that vitamin A is very important for all aspects of development. It also plays a role in the most important process in the body, gene expression, literally influencing how every single cell is made. When we look at breast milk, there is a significant vitamin A variance and pigs can actually be born without eyes due to vitamin A deficiency. The same thing can be said about vitamin K from plant foods in regards to questionable absorption from plant foods as we need fat for absorption and fat is only found in animal foods in all climates and regions throughout the entire year. This study shows that fat is required for vitamin K absorption and greatly increases it. We know infants are incredibly prone to being deficient in vitamin K, which is crucial for development, especially of the skeletal system, as shown in this study. Now, the most glaring and significant thing to me is the variance in DHA levels in breast milk among nursing women. The variance is incredible. This shows a variance of 0.05% to 0.73%, over tenfold. And here's another study showing 0.06% to 1.4%, over a 20 times variance in DHA levels in the breast milk. And here we have a study indicating the importance of DHA and the various tissues that it is required for in pretty much all stages of life, especially childhood and pregnancy. Now, if I was a baby and I understood these statistics, I would want my mother consuming wild caught fish and high omega-3 animal foods as often as possible. Moving on to the B vitamins, here's a study of B vitamin variants in lactating mothers. This study shows all vitamin variants in human breast milk and another one showing that vitamin D status influences breast milk levels and that Malaysian women are prone to vitamin D deficiency. I guess that's a location where you would think that they do actually have pretty good access to sun. But So although I said that DHA and omega-3 intake was the most significant thing that I noticed in the research I was doing, these charts that I'm about to present showing that birth weight, height, intellectual achievement, and pubertal timing are correlated with birth month, this to me is shocking to the general person. The first chart shows month of birth versus birth weight. The second shows pubertal timing. The third shows height. And the final chart shows likelihood to continue post 16 year education. Interestingly enough, this correlates directly to the natural cycle of human life, where the sun comes out in the spring and summer, we get our vitamin D3 intake, and then during the fall and late summer is when animals are fatter and we are speculatively getting fatter before winter comes so we can survive the winter on our fat soluble vitamin stores. What that means is that babies born during the late spring to early summer are going to get a lot more vitamin D3. Therefore, that is why we see a positive association. And contrary to that, babies born in months where the D3 exposure wasn't high have negative things associated in all of these aspects. And for those of you that don't want to read two dozen studies, here is an article actually promoting the importance of giving birth in natural cycles, consuming nutrient dense foods in the summer when they are plentiful, getting pregnant and giving birth next plentiful season, hypothetically in the spring. The Weston Price Foundation actually has a write-up of what pregnant women should be consuming and it's actually a pretty good guideline. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Weston Price, he is a dentist who went around in the early 1900s and studied the diet of primitive and native peoples. He correlated the nutrient density of animal foods in the diet to physical development. And what these guidelines do is they demonstrate how many animal foods per day or week you actually need to consume to obtain nutrient density. And it is so significantly higher than what pretty much any American woman has ever followed in the past dozens of years. Two teaspoons of cod liver oil per day for vitamins A and D. One quart of raw milk every day for overall fat soluble vitamin intake four tablespoons of butter for additional vitamins every day, two or more eggs daily, and plenty of yolks throughout the week for high vitamin K2 intake, as well as DHA, 
fresh liver once or twice a week just to really add to that vitamin A intake as well as just every vitamin in general. And then seafood several times per week, increasing the DHA content as well as overall nutrient content of the diet. Emphasis on wild fatty fish, fish eggs, and shellfish. Outside of nutrient density from these high quality organ meats, offcuts, eggs, animal foods that have a high fat content that are very high quality, fresh beef, lamb, and meats are to be consumed as most of your calories. Of course, the Weston Price Foundation also recommends some traditional native plant foods from vegetables to fruits to bone broth, fermented plant foods, properly prepared whole grains, but none of those foods are actually conducive to nutrient density. Those can be used for women who feel like they operate better on a higher carbohydrate metabolism. The most important thing here is that these animal foods are present in the diet. And from a percentage perspective, if you're not consuming 65 to 70% of your calories from high quality animal foods when you're pregnant, your baby will not develop properly. And this does not just apply to pregnancy, this applies to the health of the sperm and the egg when it's conceived. So the couple should be following this diet for months to years before they actually conceive the child. The pregnant woman needs to continue this diet during pregnancy as well as nursing periods. And then after the child is breastfed, typically for four to five years in many indigenous groups, the shortest period of time they would breastfeed is actually around three years. So after that period of time, then the child needs to obtain this nutrition from animal foods during early stages of life. Literally 65% to 70% of their calories from animal foods from when they stop breastfeeding to when they are fully developed in their 20s. And what this ensures is essentially being perfect physically. From the bone development of your face to your height to your organs, your bone structure, Every single part of your body requires these nutrients in large amounts from animal foods. And if we're able to consume 65 to 70% of them every single day during these key developmental stages, this is a guarantee. Now, where there's like a margin of error or where there's alleviation will change things that we attribute to modern problems like genetics. For people that are very short or very tall, we can assume there is a partly genetic role in regards to genetics. What we mean is what their ancestors consumed over the past several hundred years. So it took Italians years and years and years of high grain consumption to lower the height of the population overall. So if your kids suddenly start consuming high amounts of animal foods, they will be taller than you, but it's not like they're going to shoot up and be seven feet tall. The consumption of animal foods in high amounts takes generations to recover from generations of poor dieting. So this is just something to consider and keep in mind. I think I've presented you guys with enough information that shows that these vitamins are very important and the Weston Price Guidelines are pretty good starting points. If you guys do want to reach out to me for one-on-one -on -one consultations in regards to optimizing the nutrient density of your diet, just to get specific numbers, uh, you can shoot me an email or reach out to me through the contact form on my website. All of that stuff is below. But if you guys would like to support the channel, please subscribe and share the video. And as I mentioned earlier, this is something very close to me and a very sensitive topic. Uh, if you guys think this will help people out, please share the video. If you guys want to support me on Amazon or Patreon, on my Amazon shop, I do have nutrient-dense foods you can use like cod liver and vitamin D3 supplements. Uh, I didn't really touch on the importance of vitamin D3 in the Weston Price recommendations, but you should definitely be either supplementing or getting plenty of sun and exercise. Ideally, as much of your body exposed as possible. If you guys would like to check out my hygiene products on frank-stefano.com, if you want to look like Slick Rick or Dapper Don, uh, my pomade will be out on Saturday. And thank you guys so much again for watching. If you guys would like to see any particular videos or topics in the future, or just let me know how you liked the presentation of this video, please let me know.